Hello everyone, my name is Kuvina and welcome to part 2 of my series on relativity. This episode will be about time dilation. You've probably seen part 1, so let's just get right into it. In order to keep track of relativistic effects, I will keep a list of rules. This list is not official in any capacity, but I find it to be very helpful. The first two rules on this list are actually just the postulates of relativity, which were covered in the previous video. Just as a refresher, an inertial reference frame, or IRF for short, is just the perspective of an observer that isn't accelerating. The first postulate states that the laws of physics are the same in any inertial reference frame. This rule actually has a name, it's called the principle of relativity. The second postulate states that the speed of light is the same in any inertial reference frame. This rule is called invariance of C. With those two rules written down, let's get into time dilation. Time dilation is a phenomenon in which time passes at different rates depending on your reference frame. Specifically, when you travel faster, time passes slower. This can be thought of as moving faster through space, but at the cost of moving slower through time. You might hear this and think it must be some kind of illusion, but no, it really does happen. For example, the International Space Station orbits Earth very quickly at a speed of 7600 meters per second. Because of this, people who spend time up there literally age more slowly. When they come back to Earth, they will have aged by a few milliseconds less than those who stayed on Earth. A few milliseconds of difference over six months is not much, but it is measurable, and tests involving sending clocks up there have confirmed that time dilation is real. The reason it's only a few milliseconds is that, although 7600 meters per second is a lot to us, it's still basically nothing compared to the speed of light. As your speed gets closer to the speed of light, these effects become more and more significant. But how much more? How do we actually quantify the amount of time dilation? Well, we can derive the formula by using the relationship between distance, velocity, and time. As you probably remember, velocity equals distance over time. This also means that distance equals velocity times time, and time equals distance over velocity. This means that an object can travel along a set path, and as long as you know both the distance of the path and the velocity of the object, you can use those to calculate how long it takes to complete the path. Now let's apply that concept to the following situation. There are two observers, stayer and mover. The stayer is on Earth, and the mover is going past in a spaceship. The spaceship is traveling at velocity v and is a distance l across. Now, the mover suddenly turns on their photon machine. A photon is fired out, bounces off the wall, and returns to its starting location. From the mover's perspective, the path is just a straight line back and forth. From the stayer's perspective, though, the photon travels at an angle, so the path it takes is longer. So the path is longer in the stairs reference frame, but the speed of light is the same for both of them. Since time is distance over velocity, it means that the photon will take more time to complete the longer path. In other words, even though both of them are measuring the same event, it takes longer in the stairs reference frame, meaning that time itself passes at different rates. But we want an exact formula, so we need to introduce some variables. dm is the length of the photon's path for the mover, and ds is the path's length for the stayer. Likewise, tm and ts represent the time it takes for the photon to come back to its starting point for both the mover and stayer respectively. Meanwhile, the speed of light, c, is the same for both of them. Now, remember when I said time equals distance over velocity? Well, if we apply that to these variables, we get the equations tm equals dm over c, and ts equals ds over c. And now, to find tm and ts, we just need to find dm and ds, or the length of the path in each reference frame, 
DM is really easy because the path it takes is just a straight line. It covers the length of the ship L twice, so DM equals 2L. As for DS, it's actually really simple when you realize that each half is just the hypotenuse of a right triangle. This side has a length equal to L, and if we call the other side length B, then the Pythagorean theorem tells us that the hypotenuse has a length square root of L squared plus B squared. So the length of the full path is just two times this. But what is B? Well, it's half of this distance, which we'll call A. A is just the distance the ship travels in the time it takes the photon to bounce back. The ship travels at velocity V, and since distance is velocity times time, this gives us A equals TS times V. Keep in mind that we're using TS, because this is from the Stairs reference frame. Now with these six equations, we need to find a formula that expresses TM in terms of TS, V, and C, and nothing else. If you want, feel free to pause and try it on your own. But if not, here we go. So first of all, the movers equations both involve DM, meaning we can substitute it from the second into the first. This gives us Tm equals 2L over C. Then, we're actually going to rearrange this to isolate L, giving us L equals 1 half Tm times C. This is so that we can substitute it in somewhere later, so keep this in mind. Then we have to do a similar thing with the Stairs equations. First, we substitute the fourth equation into the third, giving us B equals 1 half TSV. Then we substitute that into the second equation. Since there was a b squared, it's the same as squaring each term in 1 half tsv. Then, this 2 in front is actually the same thing as square root of 4, meaning we can distribute it on the inside, where it cancels out the 1 fourth. Then we substitute this into the first equation. We then multiply by c and then square both sides to get this interesting looking equation. So by combining the movers equations, we got L equals 1 half TMC, and combining the stairs equations just gave us TS squared C squared equals 4L squared plus TS squared V squared. Now we're going to put it all together by substituting the first into the second. The 1 half TMC gets all of its terms squared, and the 1 fourth cancels out with this 4. Then we'll divide by C squared, subtract the last term to the other side, factor out this ts squared, take the square root of both sides, and then divide this square root to the other side. And this finally gives us the time dilation equation. ts equals tm times 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared term actually has a special name. It's called the Lorentz factor, and is extremely important in relativity. It's represented by the Greek letter gamma, which means you can write the equation as Ts equals Tm times gamma. Of course, there's also the version that gives Tm in terms of Ts, where you multiply by just the square root term instead of its reciprocal. Personally, I find this one to be a lot more intuitive, so that's what I'll use. In this case, the square root term is called the alpha factor, and you can write it as tm equals ts times alpha, but I prefer to just stick with the full equation. So now we can add time dilation to the list as the third rule. With the equation for time dilation, we can now apply it to an example. There are two observers, Mary and Botan. They both start off on Earth at the same age of exactly 20 years old. Botan remains on Earth, but Mary takes off in a spaceship, traveling 60% the speed of light, or 0.6c. The question is as follows. By the time Botan is 25, how old will Mary be? Well, since Botan is stationary and Mary is traveling at 0.6c, it means that Botan is the stayer and Mary is the mover. So if Botan ages from 20 to 25, that means five years have passed for her. And since she's the stayer, TS equals five years. Mary is traveling at 0.6c, which means that V equals 0.6c. Now, to find the time passed for Mary, 
we just need to plug in these values in the equation and solve for tm. Since the velocity is in terms of c, the c squared actually cancels out, and we're left with 1 minus 0 0.36, which is 0 0.64. The square root of that is 0 0.8, and 5 times 0 0.8 is 4, so tm equals 4. This means that by the time Boton is 25, Mary will only be 24, due to the effect of time dilation. But hold up a minute. From Mary's perspective, she's the one that's stationary, and Boton is the one traveling at 0.6c. If we do the same calculations again, from Mary's perspective, we'll find that when Mary ages 4 years, Boton only ages 3.2 years. So the time dilation formula is trying to tell us that Mary is younger than Boton, but also that Boton is younger than Mary. So clearly this formula can't be true, because it leads to a contradiction, right? Well, as it turns out, this is actually not a contradiction at all, and it's just a natural consequence of relativity called relativity of simultaneity, and there's a sense in which both perspectives are true at the same time. If you want to find out how this is possible, well that will be the subject of part 3. For now though, make sure to like and subscribe so you'll see the next video when it comes out. And of course, make sure to comment feedback, suggestions, or anything else you want to say. So with that, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!